here. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I know it's the holiday season and totally nuts, so I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to start off with a little story. Um, it's funny that we're here in Yelp. Um, I, I remember um, 11 years ago when I moved here from a small town in Kansas. Um, I didn't really know anybody. I'm pretty extroverted, pretty social. So it was kind of killing me to have zero friends and to be super lonely. Um, but it was like right around the time of Yelp Elite. Um, so I joined Yelp Elite and um, wrote like 100 reviews and went to all the parties at the new restaurants and learned the city and um, ended up with like a million friends. And um, I was sort of like living in the dorms. Like I could go around the city and see someone I knew everywhere, even in my first six months in the city. So it was actually really formative to my feelings about community building and um, just the way I interact um, with a lot of the events that I designed. So it's really perfect that I'm here tonight. So thank you, Yelp, for making my transition into San Francisco so much smoother. Um, so I feel like I'm using the Keynote app. It's amazing. Do you know that you can do this? You can use the Keynote app and you have your speaker notes. Anyway, so um, on that topic of loneliness, um, it's becoming more and more clear that there are real health detriments to loneliness. Uh, in Fortune.com, they talked about, indeed, many nations around the world now suggest we are facing a loneliness epidemic. The challenge we face now is what can be done about it. Um, why, why loneliness is a public health threat. So it's a, a genuine health issue for a lot of people, the way that our, our communities are getting more and more um, just isolated, people are interacting more online and less in person. It's actually a genuine health problem. I, I love this quote from Kurt Vonnegut. I think I put it in every presentation I give. What should young people do with their lives today? Many things, obviously. But the most daring thing is to create stable communities in which the terrible disease of loneliness can be cured. OK, so I'm going to do an, a little activity. I'm sorry, audience participation, forgive me. Um, so I'm going to ask you to stand up if you agree with the statement. Um, stand up if you agree with the statement that I, that I am making. Just one second. So stand up if you feel really uncomfortable about standing up when I ask you to. I appreciate the honesty. These are my people. I appreciate that. I love it. Stand up if you've never felt lonely. I mean, I assumed not. But otherwise, I would have questions. I would want to know more. Um, stand up if a time of feeling like you didn't have any friends stood out as one of the worst times in your life. Right? Stand up if you think it's hard to make new friends as an adult. Wow. Stand up if you wish you could take loneliness away from other people. My people, yes! I love it. I love it. So the cool thing is, Every single event, including this wonderful uh, series, Designers and Geeks, that you're at, but every single event does a little bit to cure loneliness. But uh, many events, events also create cultural change, and I'm excited to talk to you about that. First, I'm going to give you a little background about myself, because you're probably wondering who I am, what my background is. Um, so when I moved to San Francisco, when I was lonely on my couch before I found Yelp, um, I uh, worked for uh, sort of called JPEG Magazine that I'm sure no one has heard of or remembers. But it was sort of like a cross between Flickr and maybe like Dwell, or it was in my mind. So I thought it was the coolest thing ever. It was this photo magazine. It was sort of like pre-Tumblr, where to get visual inspiration. And it was user generated. I won't go into more. But um, basically, I got hired as a senior designer. And then my boss got fired in like the bloodiest internet hate storm imaginable. This is like, I was like within a year of moving to San Francisco. Um, but so the, the work still needed to be done. So I was doing his work and then got promoted to design director and then editor in chief. And then I was laid off. So it was like the ultimate, like, super shaky ground startup in San Francisco story. Like, they get burned by the startup that doesn't have its, its um, act together at all um, story. But I, 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 don't, uh, I don't mind it. But so that was sort of. Uh, disorienting experience because I thought I was an editor then. I was like, well, I made a career progression. I'm clearly an editor now, not a designer. And also, my desk is really messy, and the designer's desks are really clean. So I'm obviously not a designer. I'm an editor. Um, and that was a funny time. It was right after the economy collapsed. 
So um, I decided I had no job options whatsoever. It was like early 2009 when everything was closing and you know, uh, publishing was going down the tubes. Um, so I created my own um, online magazine. I wanted to stay an editor. I did the design on it as well, but I still wanted to be an editor day to day. So as I wrote here, um, I tried to be the Ira Glass of the photo essay and um, the world noticed. Um, I told human stories, I have a picture. Um, I told human stories like people would submit a photo um, and a caption, just one photo, just one caption, to themes like the one who got away or culture shock or um, about meaningful moments or whatever. And I would um, edit the photos and the text and work with some of the top designers, people like Nick Felton and Jessica Hish and Ryan Sims and Nas Hamid. And they would create, they would guest design and create these beautiful sort of magazine-like showcases. So I got to stay an editor. I got a ton of press. Um, people were into it. I got to get all this wisdom from people's life stories, and it was great. But I really hated selling advertising. Like, you would not believe how much I had, because I was the only person. It was just me and the grace of friends who guest designed or, or guest edited. But I really, really hated doing the business side of it and, and cold calling and selling ads. That was just so miserable. So um, I went back to design. Um, I was super lucky that um, Pinterest brought me on almost four years ago today. Um, and I say super lucky, though I had these interesting projects and had done interesting things, um, I'm very self-taught at everything, self-taught designer, editor, everything. Um, so I, it was a great experience to get to have a lot of fun creating events and having sort of the loose, warm um, style with a lot of heart that I'm used to, but also to get to really shore up my design skills and like learn all the things that I hadn't really learned working by myself or as the only designer or getting promoted out of a design job too quickly when I didn't really learn the fundamental steps. So I really appreciated that experience to learn. And like, look how much fun we had. I got to um, design a pinnabago. We love puns. Um, and a pennant, pennant uh, there on the right. Um, and this was one of the first events I did. Pennant pinata. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pun, pun loving place. Um, yeah, and just some other stuff. And, um, but yeah, like I said, I got to really shore up my technical skills there and super appreciated that. Um, so another place you may have seen my work about a year ago, um, well, you may have seen it over by the beer, um, the posters over there. Um, but um, I made these posters about a year ago for the Women's March, um, and I decided to put them on Medium um, and also make hundreds for my colleagues at Pinterest. Um, so I think it was downloaded thousands of times um, on Medium and ended up all over the world. And these are some shots that I pulled from Instagram. So it was just really neat to do a little design thing and see it have a, an impact. So you may have seen that if you went to the marches here in San Francisco or, or maybe elsewhere. Um, so yeah, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, we'll get back to what I, what I skipped in that, though, is the events that I um, was involved with in that time. So let's jump back into that now. So I want to talk a little bit about what I said before about the power of events. Um, hopefully I hit home the importance of loneliness. We, we all are on the same page there. I feel like the, the activity showed us. Um, but yeah, I, I want to also talk about that social change piece. Um, a few years ago, my friend Julie introduced me to a friend of hers and said, this is my friend Laura. She um, creates events that become movements. And I found that extremely flattering, but not really true at all. Like, that, those are big shoes to fill. Um, it's maybe something that someday I'd like to say that it's true, but uh, something to work up to. But I realized that um, I have been part of some cultural waves in the past. And um, I started for this talk really thinking about why that happened and what was going on there. And I think what happened is that when I was creating my own events, I was, or even for Pinterest, I'll give some examples there, or for other clients, um, I was really thinking about a big cultural need and really driven by a big cultural need. And I think when you are driven by a cultural need, uh, you tend to ride with a wave of cultural change. And I'm not saying at all that I created that cultural change, but just being part of that sort of ocean wave. So I'm going to go through three case studies and kind of explain what I mean by that. So um, food camp and eat retreat are some uh, they're sister events, so I'm combining them together. There are retreats that I started. So as I wrote here, uh, when an ambitious camping trip turns into an annual creative retreat for photographers. So where we left off, I had that JPEG magazine job. Um, 
and that was publishing photographers. And um, they were amazing, super talented folks, um, mostly in their 20s and 30s. And after I got laid off, I started blogging about some of them and kind of learning more about them. And I realized how similar they all were and how they all worked independently, as I was at the time, and didn't have a creative community. They didn't know other photographers. They were more competing with each other than part of a community. So I sent the most terrifying email of my life um, that I had to just will myself to press send. And that was an email inviting 80 strangers whom I had never met to um, meet me at China Camp State Park in the North Bay, um, so to meet me on a camping trip. And um, bizarrely enough, 20 of them said yes and came. Uh, people came from England. They came from Australia. They came from all over the world. Oh, OK, is it is the sound off? We can move it up, maybe, or? Is this OK? Yeah, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it, is it on? OK. Or it's a, it's a little low. Can we move? I'm a little tall. I think I would still have. Yeah, maybe that's good. Is that good? Okay. Sound check. Sound check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think this is good. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, it was this totally intimidating thing. Uh, oh, people came from all around the world. It was like the most famous Flickr photographer. This is the era that I'm talking about. This is 2009. Um, yeah, so I saw that cultural need for this group of independent creators and designers to have a community and have a sense of community with each other. It was sort of like my proto-retreat in that way and really influential of a lot of the work I want to do going forward is when you see that need to connect people. Um, so I sent this, like once I had my 20 people, I sent each of them a little postcard of the bottom half of someone else's face. And this is pre-Instagram, so this is actually just really flickerable. Somehow that never took off. Not Instagrammable, flickerable, no. Um, and while it was an intimidating task to take these strangers and make them into a, a force of, of its own, um, it was just incredibly rewarding. And what happened is we had amazing photos, of course, from the weekend. And I um, put them together into the story of Foot Camp. Um, using my editorial and design skills. And I got a lot of um, inbound interest and attention, heard from like the New York Times and uh, from folks who wanted to sponsor it and just people who wanted to be friends and were also doing cool event things. So it was a really surprising thing. This is like just the timeline. This is while I was working on my serious journalism magazine project. And I was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna do this other thing on the side. And weirdly enough, like I totally burnt out on the serious thing, but the the weird thing I was doing on the side actually is continuing to keep my interest and be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm going to read this postcard um, to kind of show what it has meant to people. I think it, so there have been about six foot camps now, I think. And um, so I'm just going to read this if I can. Laura, I want to dearly thank you for the wonder and possibility that is foot camp. I remember on the first night I said I thought foot camp was going to be a life changing experience. It absolutely was. Foot camp is my forever. Full of growth, friendship, adventure, thank you, <laughs> love and kindness. I'm. Forever okay, forever change, sorry guys. <laughs> I have, my screen is smaller than your screen. Um, so, um, and uh, sorry if I ruined the effect by stumbling over that, but um, I honestly have like a dresser drawer of letters like this. And that is just the best feeling ever. There's nothing that, there's no amount of clipboards and spreadsheets that can take away the joy of that. Though sometimes. <laughs> um, so yeah, and just to share some more eye candy, we did a lot of light painting fun. And I promised, uh, I think I put on LinkedIn, I put this photo on LinkedIn and I promised to tell the story of it. Um, every foot camp would kick off with um, Ryan Schutte, who regularly does these sort of Gregory Crudes and Jeff Wall style cinematic photos. So every foot camp would kick off with Ryan bringing all these crazy props and costumes. My name was embroidered on that polo. 
it said camp counselor Laura on there. Um, so he would bring all this insane stuff and set everyone up into the, their places. And this was his dream to have this many extras who were willing to, you know, go canoe for him. And um, and it was just incredible. And like the guy, the poor guy in the mud. That's Will Wilkinson. You guys might know. He's like a known designer. Anyway, um, so. It was just incredible to be a part of every time. Um, I have many of them framed in my house. So in terms of the hidden power of Foot Camp, I'm covering this with each of the case study. So I think it was absolutely the fact that it was sort of the proto-retreat for me, and by that I mean it was like the example of the universal lessons that could work for any, any retreat or either even long-term gathering or lengthier gathering. Um, and so what, what it kind of came down to was how replicable the bonding was. Um, and I'll show you in a second, Eat Retreat, the sister event. But basically, if you get 40 or fewer people, and I do believe it needs to be under 40, um, for like two, three days, two to four days out in the country, and they have beer and coffee, um, and they have something in common, some bonding element, you will have an amazing community form out of that. It's like physics or something. Um, and the reason, I have a theory about this, and I think if you meet a new person and you really like them and hit it off, you will either see them a couple more times within the next month, or you will not become close friends. That, that I have this theory. So when you can combine those first three or four conversations into one weekend, then you have cracked the code. And when you can do that with 40 people, you've like really cracked the code. And you have people who will be addicted to each other and really support each other long term. Um, and a lot of that long term support meant uh, Facebook groups or other online support things to keep the, the commitment and the support for each other. But another interesting thing when, when I talk about movements, so it's very strange. We were doing foot camp in the Flickr days. And then Instagram launched, and we all joined within the first few days, um, all of the foot camp people, including myself. And we all got put on the suggested user list and ended up with like hundreds of thousands of followers. So another weird side effect is I think I maybe need to apologize a little bit for the hipster photography be cultural beginnings of Instagram because it, we had just had such an early effect and we had so many followers that it had this other weird side effect of cultural change there. So um, I want to share some ideas to steal. I promised ideas to steal. Besides the universal structure of retreats, and I'm happy to go into that more after if anyone has any questions. Because um, really, I want anyone to steal my ideas. There's way more demand for people to get to be part of experiences like this than there are people wanting to do the clipboards and um, spreadsheets of it. So please, steal my ideas. Ask me how to do it. If you feel a calling towards this, like the world needs it for sure. So I think having, um, you know, now you would call it Instagrammable, but having some kind of catchy invite or announcement to build buzz is obviously a stealable idea. I think the flag there on the right is a, um, oh, well, and also, why not get all of your friends color-coded and into boats on a river? That's a stealable idea. No, the flag, um, it's reusable every year. It's quick Instagrammable, builds momentum in real life, too. Um, this, I think, is a really stealable good idea. I'm a little mad at myself for giving this away. Um, for folks who work with brands um, or sponsored, do sponsored events, um, having worked on the brand side, I've worked on a brand design team at Pinterest, I know how particular they are about how they, the logo is used and how the placement is. So I think it's best to work with physical objects. Plus, it feels way more genuine to have these mugs that say Squarespace rather than like a Squarespace logo and the image. So I just sent, I, I couldn't make it to this one because I, I had a newborn, but I just sent vinyl letters and mugs to the event and they made this. And then there were like 12 posts of some variation of this and the brand was super happy. So I think that's a super stealable idea for anyone working with a sponsored event. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Eat Retreat, the sister event. This one was for leaders in the food community. Um, and something I didn't mention about food camp, but it's attendee-led, meaning the people who come actually teach a lot of the workshops and determine the programming. So I would just sort of set the, the tone and the framework for it. So for example, at Eat Retreat, um, this was a food stylist kit that she opened up. These are uh, some chefs filleting fish. 
Uh, this was the first night of the first one. And then on the right, you can see some of the activities on the most recent one uh, about a September ago. So about Midwest food traditions and bitters and American cheese tasting. Just another eye candy shot, beautiful scenery. Always great when you have live music. So the hidden power of e-retreat, just to talk about that for a second, I think it's the same thing like sort of the proto-retreat thing that I mentioned earlier. But also, I feel such a calling every year more so uh, that we need to rebuild a food tradition and culture in America. Like, I don't know who else here grew up eating like Oreos and um, minute rice and ranch-style beans and food out of boxes and cans, but I definitely did. And I don't feel like I can eat the way that my parents and grandparents did. So that's the social change that I really want to see out of Eat Retreat is rebuilding food traditions for our children and grandchildren. Because I feel like we're a little bit of a lost generation in terms of food traditions in America right now. So ideas to steal from Eat Retreat. Um, I love this one. Um, I found a note today. We didn't use a single disposable cup, plate, or fork. I'm really into the zero waste thing. So we wrote everyone's name on a mason jar and they had to keep it the whole weekend and keep it clean or full of beer or whatever they wanted to do. And then could take a yogurt starter or whatever home with it at the end of the weekend. But I think going zero waste for events seems like it's harder and in some ways it's actually easier and just way better all around. Um, for food camp and eat retreat, we always had a super summer camp style overheard at boot camp for eat retreat. And I still have so many of these in my closet. Um, but at this one, someone took some of the vinyl letters and put love is real up in the corner. And that's what I was feeling there is just super full of um, love and acceptance from the people there who I had so much in common with. So it meant so much to me that someone put that up there. And then again, the vinyl letters on plates. And then these are actually chalkboard tablecloths, which I highly recommend as a way to label and just food looks great on there. Again, a flag. I didn't design it, but I like it. Um, and then we did a portrait series at every, that's a video, but it's not working. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, okay, that video's not gonna work. It's not, not a problem. Okay, um, so just doing portraits with Portraits where people shared their food philosophy and made for a really fun portrait series every year. So switching gears, um, I was really, really lucky a couple about four years ago um, working with Dropbox to um, get to work on a women in design event. It was actually uh, right after I had my first child. And... Um, at the time, I was really confused about, I was freelancing with Dropbox, and I was really confused about when to go back in to work full time, and I put this on Quora. Um, when is the best age range of my kids to go back to work full time? I just didn't really know up from down, and I knew that um, I was really bored, and I really missed my computer and design, and I was really sleep deprived, and my son was colicky, and I really needed an uh, an outlet, and yet also really loved my baby and felt really drawn to him. Um, so I was looking uh, to the internet for guidance. And I got kind of the worst responses from people saying that like once they're 12, they should be ready. And just these really depressing responses when you're in that, that mode. Um, and I really felt such a strong need for role models. And you know, this was only four years ago, but I think even way more so then than now, mothers would not bring up that they had children. Certainly not in interviews, but maybe not like much in the workplace and certainly not much, you know, in, um, in social or professional life. And I can tell you from having been a mother of small children with a full-time job, I did not have time to be writing articles or giving talks. I'm a freelancer now, which is why I can do that now. So I really felt a lack of role models. Um, so yeah, the cultural need, a need for role models for working moms. Um, yeah, they are, it's proven that they're discriminated against. Oops, my keynote up close. It's proven that they're discriminated against in hiring. It's one of the most discriminated against groups, mothers are. So I just felt so lucky to get to work on 
not only a women in design event, but I asked them if we could do it as moms in design, and they said yes. So I worked with um, the wonderful Saleo Cuervo, and then also Alice Lee, the very talented Alice Lee. I don't know if you guys know those guys. Um, but Alice was throwing out ideas, and she was just running through things, and she was like, what if we call it this or this? And she said, my mom is so talented. And that one just hit me like a punch in the stomach, because it's something that we don't hear. It's something that, that isn't said about moms. I think I have... bad, right? And, and I added a T, and I'm happy to tell you, I did this today, I'm happy to tell you my mom is so talented, it is in there somewhere. So we did, we did something. Um, but yeah, it's so depressing, right? Um, but it was just so much fun to get to do that work right then. I got to write a Medium post. They asked me to write a Medium post about my experience and feeling really disoriented and um, kind of proof that I wasn't, that it was meeting a cultural need and I wasn't the only one feeling that way. It was um, on the editor's picks and you know, also weirdly later featured in a Facebook video and it, it was something that was really resonant with a lot of people. Um, and I also made these postcards that I took to XOXO and Brooklyn Beta that said, my mom is so talented, she, and I had people fill them out and I put them all on a Tumblr. And again, there was a cultural need for this, so it picked up steam and was fe featured several places. Which like, for like a corporate branded thing, that, that's pretty good. That's clearly meeting a need. Um, this was the event itself and honestly, it was kind of electric. Um, a lot of women came who weren't moms who just didn't know what their careers were gonna look like once they had kids and just had no idea what to expect, just like I didn't when I had a newborn. Um, and besides uh, the panel, we also had a video booth where people could tell their own stories of their talented moms. And one um, Google PM, who I know, uh, grew up in Manhattan, and his mom is like a super amazing, famous architect, and he got to tell her story, and that was amazing to see. And we also had postcard stations where you could write, my mom is so talented, she, like, fill that up, sentence out, and then send it to your mom. Uh, and the other cool thing, this is my son on his first day of preschool. Go ahead, tell me how cute he is. <laughs> He's really cute. Um, but so he, we also had these lunch bags, um, which is really great because I sent both my kids to school with these, my mom is so talented lunch bags. And I don't care what the other moms thought because, you know, got work to do for quality. <laughs> um, and we also had these uh, temporary tattoos. Um, and the really fun part about this uh, a few weeks ago, I made this uh, construction paper monstrosity here. And can you guess what my son said to me? He said, wow, mom, you are so talented. I was like, it works. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think you guys know the research. This is from Harvard Business Review. Even women think men are more creative. Both men and women rated creativity higher when told that the architect was a man. I find myself doing this all the time. I find having that kind of bias. Um, it is so ingrained. So just even every little bit, like my son, or, you know, whoever came across that makes a difference. So I think you know what the hidden power of my mom is so talented would be, like just changing people's perceptions about what a mom can be. Um, the, I went to the Tumblr today. It's, I mean, I found them really heartwarming to read still. So some ideas to steal. Um, so these blackboards, we ordered them two hours before the event. They showed up 45 minutes before, and we chalked them up because we realized it's a panel and we didn't have a presentation, and that if we didn't give people something to look at, they would be analyzing our every pore, and we did not want that to happen. So, uh, but it, you know, besides the fact that we should have put our, um, our like Twitter handles and whatnot, and the event hashtag and just didn't think of it, it was like a great last minute solve and something I highly recommend. Um, and then if you have moms uh, going, coming to your event, the lunchbox was a great, and the um, sticker I thought were, or the temporary tattoo I thought were great swag pieces. And then the postcards were a lot of fun too in, in terms of building buzz ahead of time for an event and having more of an impact. Like I had an impact at um, you know, XOXO and Brooklyn Beta, not just at my event here in San Francisco and more people saw it. Okay, so the last case study. Um, 
Again, I feel super fortunate to have gotten to work on this. Um, basically, when I came back from maternity leave at Pinterest, um, they asked me to create a cultural moment, a defining cultural moment for Pinterest. Um, so I got to help found and design Pinterest internal conference. Um, so the cultural need there, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Pinterest culture to help you understand this. So I came in just being like, I was in a magazine, I'm kind of a big deal, like I've won some big awards and whatever, I'm hot shit, obviously, and then immediately was like, oh no, I am not as cool or good as anyone else here, um, and everyone else is cool about it, and I really need to get my act together and pull, pull, it, pull it in. Um, and that is true, like there are McSweeney's published um, people on the writing team and like semi-professional athletes and ballerinas and like Pinterest is an amazing place. Like uh, I heard once that Evan, one of the founders said that Pinterest is a place for people who have more passions than time, like more interests than time, which just made me feel like, oh, there are others like me, that's wonderful. So while it's great that there's all these amazing people and that they have their egos in check, that also leaves a lot of their personality just kind of like stuffed in the corner. So when thinking about how to meet a cultural need for a big cultural event for the company, it was really important for me to think about how to let people shine as their full whole selves in, the off in an office culture where they weren't really, it wasn't really, it was pretty frowned upon to, to do that. Um, so Nikon was born, um, and let me explain Nikon, and then I'll explain what Nikon is, or like why it's called Nikon. So there's a value at Pinterest called knitting, um, and that means it's not a design culture or an engineering culture, it's more of a cross-disciplinary culture. And it, people say it all the time, we talk about knitting. So Nikon would be the epitome of that happening. Um, and Nikon was an event where anyone in the company can apply to teach a class. And it could be about um, style, lurking here, taught personal style. Um, it could be intersectional feminism. It could be drag makeup. It could be um, kite surfing. It could be anything. And it was as varied of the, as that, how to build a fire, um, as varied as that and, and more. Um, and to talk, since it's a design group, I'm going to talk a little bit about the design of it. I saw this pin on Pinterest. And by the way, the color is not accurate on these, but it is on the, anyway. Um, so design, design things. Um, so um, I actually designed a custom alphabet for the event the first year um, using those overlapping shapes and the idea of um, you know, something new being created when two things merge. Uh, and that became so useful. The first year I created a skylight install out of laser cut acetate, or laser cut acrylic, um, and these nine foot skylights that I was super, super pleased with. And then the second year, there's, there's Larkin again. Um, so the second year did it again in the next building. Um, and you know, who doesn't love some one inch buttons? And we did a little like song reader style, like Beck song reader style, sticker, stickerable notebook some Riso prints. Here's that alphabet the second year coming in again. This screen behind David Chang um, is every teacher from Pinterest, every person from Pinterest who taught a class. So just really respecting the people who were giving of their time and talents. Um, this was the third year of the event where we broke it down to more geometric shapes. And these were the stickers that went on the cover of the notebook. And so to talk a little bit about the hidden power, there was just so much passion in that group of people and so much talent that they didn't get to express every day. Something else I should mention, in, in addition to being able to teach a class, there was also an open mic night between um, the two days of the event. So you got to see people like kill it at their acapella singing or whatever, or just really see your coworkers as whole people and really get to express yourselves. And um, I'm really happy to say that it's been a huge hit at Pinterest. It's a lot of people's favorite thing about working there. It had something like a 99% approval rating. And you know, a lot of that big thanks to the powers that be allowing a completely non-work related event for two days. But I think it also really helped people understand why Pinterest, the product, is amazing because it helps people tap into their passions and their like what if feelings about creating things and indulging in their passions. But I was really happy that the CEO mentioned it in a talk as one of the fundamental moments in the company's history that kept it on track. 
So some ideas to steal from Nikon. Who doesn't love a little Mad Lib? Always good to have a little Mad Lib. This was an insane amount of work, but I loved it and insisted upon doing it. Um, each name tag had the letter of the first letter of the person's name, and same with tote bags. And there was no Pinterest branding on there whatsoever. Uh, the alphabet, if you can do it, if you know you're going to have a several year event, designing an alphabet can be a great way to make your life easier in the long run. These are really fun. This is laser cut eco board. It's a um, half inch thick um, recyclable foam core. And this was really inexpensive to create a super large sculpture. And then these have been reused several times. So this was just an instance where we needed to make a big splash. We couldn't damage the walls or um, you know, they wouldn't let me do the skylight thing anymore. <laughs> Too dangerous. <laughs> so it was just a great solution that made the workplace team really happy, the landlords really happy. Good stealable idea. Um, and then I don't know if these are going to work because my other video didn't, but I was just going to say how motion graphics on TVs like this are a great investment because they really change the mood of a room. And yeah, that is not going to work. So yeah, my takeaway, just in closing, um, thinking about those cultural needs and meeting them is just a great way to have a lot more impact and kind of propel yourself forward. So I would call on you guys, like whatever the, um, the change you want to see in the world, like whatever it is that you think really needs to happen. Um, say, for example, I was talking with Josh before, um, before I, the presentation about how there's this big rural and um, city divide. So maybe it's like some kind of gathering. It doesn't have to be a retreat. Maybe it's a dinner party or a happy hour or whatever it is, combining people from different backgrounds. It's just really powerful stuff to get people in the same room together.